Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have David Wolf, who is the uh, legislative director for the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, along with Philip Lorea, who is a poet and a financial advisor. And uh, we're talking about uh, politics of the day, uh, and we're doing it on Channel 17 in Sacramento, on uh, cable at www.accesssacramento.org, on YouTube and on Facebook. So, you know, look at us wherever you can find us, and we'll be there. It's an interesting political year this year. We're watching the Kavanaugh hearings where people are screaming from the audience and having to be you know, hauled out by, by the cops. Uh, it looks like absolute tribal warfare uh, over who is going to be the next Supreme Court justice. And it is tribal warfare because Democrats and Republicans are realized that a pivotal person on the, on the court can change the tenor of politics for years to come. And so it's, it's being a hard fought battle. But it illustrates that we have tribal warfare going on between Democrats and, and Republicans. Both tribes want to control the source of the revenue and be able to divert it to their own tribe. I think that's basically what's happening. And of course, the ordinary, uh, the ordinary citizen is getting really, really tired of it. We're looking at a massive number of people who are leaving the, the, the Republican Party, leaving the Democratic Party, becoming either independent or becoming libertarian. And I want to talk a little bit tonight about how libertarians are really taking politics a lot more seriously in 2018 than we have in our 40-year history. Libertarians are this year running to win, not running to hold a place on the ballot or to make a statement or to educate the public. Libertarians are actually running to win. Starting at the top of the, uh, the uh, non-presidential year ticket, Senate, U.S. Senate, uh, Gary Johnson, who is no stranger to this audience, he ran for uh, president uh, as uh, a libertarian candidate in 2012 as well as 2016. He's a two-term successful governor of New Mexico as a Republican uh, before that. He's running for Senate in New Mexico. He is polling a strong second. He's beating the Republican nominee in the polls, and he's actually beating the Republican nominee among Republican voters. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting race, and the Democrats are running scared. They have already, uh, the, uh, the, the Dem it's a strong Democratic state. I mean, voter registration is, is mostly, Dem is, is uh, skews in favor of Democrats, although independents and libertarians are a, a huge a portion of the electorate, uh, the electorate in New Mexico, just like every other uh, state in the country anymore. But the, uh, the uh, Secretary of State in New Mexico, a Democrat, running for re-election, shortly after Gary Johnson announced his candidacy, said, you know what, I think it would be a good idea to reinstate party line voting. In other words, pull the lever mm -hmm. for the Democrats, you vote Democrat in every race, same thing for Republican, who's gonna pull a, a libertarian lever, right? I think mm -hmm. that that is the reason she did that, and I think they're running mm -hmm. scared, I think they're trying to you know, play dirty tricks, the, the Libertarians, the Republicans, and a few other unaffiliated groups are suing the state of, or the, suing the, uh, the Secretary of State for making that determination because the legislature decided to get rid of party line voting in a bill that was ironically signed by Governor Gary Johnson a few years ago. Well, and the interesting thing, I, you know, if we were to take that to a larger level, um, uh, much of the kerfuffle over the uh, Russian interference in the election, uh, you know, it's sort of um, parcels out, but it sure appears that at the very least, when you look, for instance, at California and which, uh, which voter stations were at risk, they were all in the Republican uh, Central Valley strongholds. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at where the Russians sort of may have interfered with media, well, look who controls that media. You know, uh, Zuckerberg and Facebook are, are Facebook are absolutely progressive democratic um, uh, institutions. When you look at you know Amazon controlling the Washington Post, Jeff Bezos. Look at uh, uh, um, Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett, who bought up a, a number of Midwestern news newspapers just before the general election last year. So it looks like if there was any interference in the election, similar to what you're talking about, where they changed the rules such that it's going to favor one particular party over another, it sure looks
looks like both in the uh, New Mexican uh, election as uh, well as what happened in general with the Russian interference was not to favor Trump. It was clearly the beneficiary of it were, were for the Democrats. Mm -hmm. So when we have um, election interference, it's not the Russians or anyone else in favor of trying to get the Republicans in. It apparently, uh, it apparently, the Republicans got in in spite of the best. Well, I, I would say because of all of the interference, because what you're mm -hmm. seeing is a huge number of disgruntled people who want to vote for somebody who they do not perceive to be an insider. Now, I would argue that Trump, Trump is just as much of an insider as Hillary, but that's beside the point. Mm -hmm. People's perception of Trump is that he is an is that he's an outsider and is going to drain the swamp and all of this. Yeah. I mean, the people who, I, I, I'm a, I'm a C-SPAN junkie, I listen to uh, Washington Journal, uh, and I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. Uh, in the morning I watch, I, I watch and listen to Washington Journal, where the phone calls are not screened. It's not like Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity or any of those where they only put on people that will make the host look good. Right. Anybody that can get through to the switchboard gets on with no host screening. And people would say, you know what, this is in 2016 election, people would say, you know what, I, I don't like the way things are going, I'm gonna vote for somebody new. It's either gonna be Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump, I'm not sure which yet. Mm -hmm. Both were being perceived as the outsider, somebody that isn't Hillary, somebody that isn't Jeb, and that's who they're gonna vote for. Mm -hmm. That's what propelled Trump into office. It's a rebellion against all of the uh, fixed politics that we've been uh, looking at mm -hmm. where the media and the establishment politicians are, are essentially conniving to, uh, to stay on top. Yeah, well, and, uh, you know, and I think that when you, if you look at, say, uh, Paul Ryan, uh, a, you know, what I, I would describe as a rhino, Republican name only, uh, that the Republicans, the, the line between Republicans and Democrats is you know, virtually non-existent. Essentially, the Republicans add a religious factor of we do this in the name of God, and the Democrats say, we do this, we are God. <laughs> uh, and, and, but when you look at actual policy, there's no difference. And so Americans looked at, you know, I, I you know, point out the 2012 um, Obama re-election. The Republicans nominated the ver the only person in America, including anyone mm. here, that couldn't beat Obama because he was the guy who had actually instituted Obamacare. So they literally took the mm. one man in America who could not run against Obama on the one way that Obama was sure to get beat. And that makes you start to feel like when you see how you know Ryan acts in the House, and uh, when you see, um, for instance, how they bailed, uh, how uh, Ted Cruz just simply disappeared when it came time to vote on auditing the Fed, a bill he sponsored, uh, co-sponsored. You see how the Republicans just defect from Republicanism, and the Republican uh, yes, enough file. Republicans will defect to the Democratic side to make sure no real reform happens, exactly. and vice versa. And uh, no matter who gets business. elected, you know, business yeah. as usual. Uh, on the on a more local level, uh, uh, libertarians are making a very strong effort. Uh, and I say local, I'm talking about the uh, Riverside County, California Board of Supervisors. Now, just to put that into perspective, Riverside County has a population of two, two and a half million, something like mm -hmm. that, which makes it. Uh, the, the 11th largest county in the United States, mm -hmm. as well as a population that's greater than 16 states, greater than the population of 16 separate states. So it's a big, it's a big area, it's a big deal. Uh, and the libertarian candidate, it's a nonpartisan elect election, so I say libertarian, it's libertarian small l, because all the contenders are uh, not running under a party label. Everybody knows what they are, but it's not, it's not a partisan election. Uh, he, uh, Jeff was the, uh, the, the mayor of Calamisa in Riverside County, and as the mayor of Calamisa, he was facing a huge pension shortfall problem, a huge problem, particularly with the fire department, uh, under the control of Caltrans, uh, Cal Fire uh, 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 union contracts mm -hmm. and union rules and all of that, with a defined benefit pension pr program. So he said, well, you know what, I, we can't do this anymore. This is, this is driving the city bankrupt, literally. So he was able to essentially fire Cal Fire and start his own municipal fire department with a defined contribution pension plan. Problem solved, and he is now in a position where he can do the same thing if he is elected uh, to uh, the uh, County Board of Supervisors for Riverside County, which has its own pension problems. 
And of course, he's being fought hand and tooth by the uh, by the unions, by his, but he's being supported by. But he is being supported again. Good segue, Richard, by the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. And it's interesting, you know, Howard Jarvis is going to have our annual taxpayer conference down in Ontario, uh, actually on Saturday morning, and uh, in in San Bernardino there, and. Um, which is just north of Riverside. It is, yeah. it is. And, you know, Jeff is actually going to be one of the speakers at that oh, event. Fantastic. So I'm sure he's going to be talking about a lot of the pension reform um, efforts that he uh, that he did in the city uh, while he was mayor. And, I mean, we're all looking forward to that. I mean, we don't have a lot of examples of pension reform occurring in cities. Yeah, there's San Diego and San Jose and some other major examples. But, you know, a lot of cities still need to address this issue and to see someone tackle it so strongly and so head on, I think will be an encouragement uh, for everyone who's attending on Saturday. So we're looking forward to it. And you'll find, I think, that, uh, that Jeff Hewitt is a politician who happens to be a libertarian, as opposed to a libertarian who's trying to learn how mm -hmm. to be a politician. Absolutely. He is very, very good on the stump, very, very good with people, very, very mm -hmm. good working with other uh, politicians, Democrats, Republicans, you name it, working across the aisle and finding a way to have a, a tripartisan solution to common problems. He's, a, he's actually a problem solver, not a, not a divisive kind of a guy. And uh, he came in second, a very close second, in the top two primary back in June uh, in a five-way race. Three candidates were eliminated. Uh, running a very, very strong race to, to actually mm -hmm. win the county supervisor position in uh, San Bernardino, San, and, I'm sorry, Riverside Where's County. Riverside? And I, I think it's really exciting what I've followed over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, uh, the places that are a little under the radar but are so important where libertarians are winning. And they are at local. They are at local levels, and they, uh, you know, they tend to be positions that have to do with how that city or county handles the money. And so you are seeing these races. That, you know, we may, uh, we, you know, had a good year with the presidential election. We did. You know, we obviously weren't going to win, but. Uh, when you go further down and you look at these little localities, yeah, several hundred uh, libertarians have been elected to local exactly. office. Exactly, and that's over a over eight hundred are running for yeah. local office, local state, local and federal office this year uh, as libertarians, mm -hmm. uh, running in all fifty states, uh, 40, 48 states officially on the libertarian line, in a couple of states, Mississippi and Tennessee, I believe. Uh, they won't let libertarians on the ballot. It's just ballot access is very difficult, so they have to run as independents, but they're still running and, mm -hmm. and still, in some cases, winning. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, it goes further. I mean, we have Republicans who are saying, you know what, I don't think I'm a Republican anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't like the foreign wars. I don't like yeah. the, uh, the uh, kowtowing to Democrats' tax plans. I don't like the uh, ignorant, uh, ignoring civil liberties of people. So people like Laura Ebke in Nebraska was elected in 2014 as a Republican senator. It's a unicameral uh, one-house mm -hmm. legislature, so she was elected as a senator. And a couple of years later, she said, you know what, I, I can't stomach the Republicans anymore. I'm changing my voter registration. I'm changing my party to Libertarian. And she ran for re-election and came, again, it's an open primary, a top two primary. She came in a very strong number two in, in a five-way race for re-election uh, last June, up for, up for uh, in the general election to win uh, again in, uh, in, the, in November. And she won. She she was able to get into the top two, in spite of concerted opposition from the governor of Nebraska, who's a Republican, as well as the Republican Party, uh, with uh, funding some very very well founded funded candidates against her. Richard, I think just to speak to that enthusiasm, you know, uh, I ended up speaking to the Sacramento County Libertarian chapter a couple months ago, and um, in that and a group, fine speech it was. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, but I mean in that. In that group, you know, there was 40 to 50 people, and I think what I noticed in the group is just how young everyone was. You know, there was a bunch of millennials in the crowd, and I think that's... You mean it's not just old gray hairs like me anymore? I, Richard, you're not old. But, um, <laughs> but no, but... It, Philip is. <laughs> no. Um, but but I th but I think that was that was interesting. You know, I speak to a lot of Republican groups, a lot of Republican county central committees, and a lot of Republican women's federated groups. And yeah, as you a, know. In, in a former life, I used to speak to California women, uh, Republican women federated, and those women are nice ladies, but they're oh, not, yeah. they're certainly not millennials. No, 
but but I think that enthusiasm gap is 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 there in those groups and it's there with you know younger people and millennials and it's really really encouraging i think for the next generation who's looking at things like you know expanded federal governments and tax credit um you know programs tax reform driving up the federal deficit yeah. and all these things and just realizing hey is there another way yeah so. and you know the same thing that happened in nebraska happening in new hampshire a couple of uh, new hampshire uh, Republican uh, State House representatives, uh, Brandon Finney and uh, uh, Caleb Q. Dyer, both uh, elected as Republicans, changed their party registration, mm -hmm. running for re-election as Libertarians. Uh, in uh, other races in South Dakota, we've got a couple of candidates who are very, very strong. We have Gideon Oaks running for uh, the state Senate in, from, from, from Mount Rushmore, mm -hmm. from the, uh, the Black Hills, the mm -hmm. district that has the Southern Black Hills and Mount mm -hmm. Rushmore, and he's got a pretty good chance. In a market, by the way, or in a district where the cost of advertising is really, really low. I mean, that's mm -hmm. rural, uh, western South Dakota, uh, media costs are, are, are de minimis. So uh, funding contributions, donations go a long mm -hmm. way in that race. Same way with, uh, with uh, Aaron Aylward, who's running for the Sandy, or South Dakota State House from an area just south of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, again, running, in a, it's interesting, in South Dakota you run, they, they elect two people for every assembly district mm. as opposed to just one. And the top two for years have been a couple of Republicans. Not going to happen this year, probably. Mm. So it's 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 an interesting uh, thing going on. Same way with uh, with Amber Christensen Beltran running for Utah State House has a pretty good chance of winning. Uh, I'm not sure how good the chance is that Murray Sabrin will be able to win a senator from New Jersey. It is a very Democratic state, but there is Bob Menden, Menendez who mm -hmm. is, to say the least, ethically challenged and. <laughs> Sabrin does have uh, uh, an endorsement from somebody who libertarians perhaps have heard of, as well as Republicans, Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's encouraging. And then, of course, our, our chairman, Nicholas Sarwark, uh, chair of the Libertarian National Committee, is from Phoenix, running for mayor of Phoenix. Mm -hmm. cool. So it, it's an interesting year for libertarians running for office, uh, inter uh, interesting in the, in the respect that uh, there, a lot of them are running to actually win and make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing at the national level, which has got libertarians, as well as some Republicans, and now even Democrats uh, wrapped around the axle, is the, the whole idea of tariffs, and, and now the, the, uh, the uh, secondary effect of tariffs, which is subsidies for farmers. I, 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 the whole tariff issue is, um, is really, I don't know that it's largely understood. What's been happening in, in a move to internationalism, let's call it, um, the idea was to impoverish the U.S. and to raise the standard of living elsewhere. So Japan coming out of World War II, for instance, and uh, Europe and all of these places that we rebuilt, they've always had tariffs against our goods. We were always glad to accept that because we were so competitive, so good at what we do, that we could have a handicap. We were golfers mm -hmm. that could have a nine handicap and still beat you. Uh, what, has gone, what has happened over that long 30-year stretch uh, is that the jobs just kept eroding. And so the competitiveness that we lost by accepting tariffs on our goods being exported while mm -hmm. not imposing them coming in um, was a competitive disadvantage that ultimately cost the jobs that we now all bemoan as lost. Uh, what has happened, and I should point this out, um, that, um, for instance, the Trump administration uh, offered to the G7 when they met last month to have a tariff free zone uh, among all the G7 trading partners, the largest economies in the world. And they said, out of hand, absolutely not. Uh, the big issue is, um, is actually cars. Uh, and, uh, for instance, we were going to have a bilateral agreement uh, with Germany, maybe, that Germany would say, okay, no tariffs between our two countries with cars, uh, and now with soybeans, and the, the you know, odd thing about it is that uh, tariffs should raise the prices, that's what we're concerned about, isn't it, that you know, we're going to cost, it's going to cost more to import things. But what, when push comes to shove, what really happened with soybeans is that unless we could sell those soybeans specifically to China, that the price of soybeans was going to drop 
uh, because our consumption of soybeans just didn't justify the kind of crops that we can grow. And if, and if China has to pay tariffs to import U.S. soybeans, they can buy them from Brazil. Exactly. And, and so it, the, it is the, a, it's a fundable product. The market product itself would find yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, and what has been happening is we have been subsidizing prices. We all know whether it's mm -hmm. the farm aid bill or whatever. The point of that is to subsidize prices upward, not downward. So the argument that people make to the masses is that these, you know, what amounts to what he's doing, you know, the old cliche about leveling the playing field. He's really just looking at the dollar amount that uh, where tariffs are imposed against our goods and finding some equivalent. So the the net effect of it is actually not to drive prices up. The net effect has been to drive them down. And in some areas, what's going to happen is within a short period, a year or two, our steel manufacturers will say, well, gosh, it makes a lot of sense to produce in the U.S. The cost of energy is low, mm -hmm. technology is good. Uh, and so, you know, it, the, the slight awkwardness at a moment is going to do nothing but lead to that kind of production in the U.S. instead of outside the U.S., particularly with the significant tax. The worry I have when it comes to tariffs is, yeah, we've been accepting the, really not that high of tariffs, but we have been accepting slightly higher tariffs mm -hmm. for imports than we charge on exports. Mm -hmm. This is true. But if we start doing a... a, 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 a I forget the name of the depression area. Uh, Quid Hawkins. pro quo or what? Quid pro quo. Yeah, if we yeah. start getting into a tariff war, which mm -hmm. is what Trump has started, tariffs go up for all countries. And when tariffs sure. went up for soybeans, the soybean producer said, "Hey, we can't sell soybeans at that price. We, you know, we marked up that high." And say they said, "We're going to lose all this money." And the corn producer said the same mm -hmm. thing, as well as all of other a uh, uh, whole bunch of other commodities. And so, in order to maintain support in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Minnesota, Michigan, mm -hmm. places where he... I mean, not, the swing states. Yeah, the swing states. Uh, they say, oh, well we'll, well, we'll make it good. We'll, you know, pump in $13 billion worth of right. subsidies for soybeans and corn and so right. forth, which, of course, is like $30, $40 per person for every man, woman, and child in the country. It's, yeah. it's you know, it's serious money. Uh, so, you know, what you end up with is, is a, a, a ballooning problem. Now, if you can use that as a bargaining chip to get to no tariffs, that's fine, but I'm not so sure that's going to well, happen. Well, the difference, the thing is, is that, you know, we are the most, we consume more than anyone, uh, our, the U.S., and so at the end of the day that, uh, you know, China cannot go tit for tat with us, can't throw punch for punch with us, and they're already cracking. So their economies are just much smaller. Uh, and the same thing with the Eurozone, uh, uh, and you could say the same thing with Canada and Oh, Mexico. Eurozone is a bigger, uh, bigger uh, economy than, we are, than ours is. Well, uh, in, in the aggregate, yeah. but country and they, and by they trade country, in the aggregate. Uh, and the Eurozone is not so united uh, to be, you know, uh, to act as a monolith. Uh, but what I'm saying is there's nobody that can throw punch for punch economically with the U.S. At the end of the day, they run out of money and we don't. Maybe. We're, uh, all, we're also <laughs> $20 trillion in debt and, and climbing. Right. Who knows? Uh, we do have a better, we, we are in better shape than Cuba. Uh, in Cuba, the vice president of the Cuban Libertarian Party, Jose Marti. Who knew there was a, a Libertarian Party? And how, how did that happen? I, but there is one. There's a Libertarian Party in Cuba. And Heliberto Pons, was the, who was the vice president of that party, uh, was arrested by the Cuban uh, police. Why was he arrested? Well, he and the other members of the party put together a, uh, uh, a statement uh, de for uh, opposing a mandate from the, gov from the communist Cuban government saying that all artistic expression must be regulated and pre-approved by the Cuban communist government. You can't do a painting or write a book or do anything else, make a statue. Everything has to be approved by the, guy, by the communists ahead of time. Uh, you know, I, I, I tried to bring it back to something that's like, you know, fairly big or something, but um, I actually had this discussion earlier this afternoon whether it is government, whether it is good or right for government to, to intervene uh, for someone's, on someone's best interest. So they think. In other words, uh, you know, make the argument that the only true crime is something against someone else's person or property. Mm -hmm. And this person argued back, or to yourself, or harm to yourself. Government should be, should, that's a crime to harm yourself. 
So I brought the example of uh, Edgar Allan Poe, a guy who killed himself but produced great art. And part of the great art was him killing himself with, you know, psychedelic drugs and everything else. That's what produced, you know, what we consider deathless literature. He died at, I think it was age 50. Raven. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and never more. And so how does one determine what is in someone else's best interest? Uh, especially when you go to when you talk about art and you know and any other thing is it ever right for government to intervene on someone else's uh, on behalf of someone's yeah best I, I mean I mean that's a, that's a benign way of looking at it I'm pretty yeah. sure that the communists are not worried about uh, protecting I'm, people I'm from themselves I'm, I'm pretty sure they're protect they're worried about protecting the regime from uh, surreptitious uh, mm -hmm. non-communist sure. themes in the art that they're trying to quash mm -hmm. I, I suspect that's what's really going on Richard, I mean, not trying to be overly patriotic here, but it does make me thankful to live in America, you know, and obviously some of that freedom of speech and some of that expression is being squelched now, even in this country, um, you know, and I think especially politically we see that day by day, but it's still so much better here than it is in well, Cuba, and I think that's something... Well, that yeah, it's get. better here because we have the ability to have an anonymous uh, uh, mole in the White House and it gets published in the New York Times. We have a couple minutes left. What? Who, who do you think the mole was? Um, I, I, I know who the book. I know who the book is thinking. <laughs> <laughs> if, if they haven't read the article, it was. It really was a piece of fluff. It was, you know, gosh, we think the administration's in chaos and blah blah blah. And we, there are people that are in there preventing the madman from doing his work. Uh, but but if you really think about what the news cycle has been as as it has gone from Manafort and this in the midterm election two months in, heading in the news cycle has been Manafort uh, you know Trump is a criminal criminal to the Woodward book uh, to now the anonymous source and you think about who runs the media you know where are you seeing that if you're seeing it on Facebook Mark Zuckerberg you know if you're seeing it in the Washington Post is Jeff Bezos. Uh, you know, the richest man in the world. Uh, your software is running on Google. Uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Uh, Oracle, Larry Ellison, you're talking about the seven richest men, seven richest Americans, all white male progressive Democrats. Mm -hmm. So the news cycle is just simply going and as soon as people, they get the sense that ah, this one's not really getting any traction, uh, you can, you better believe that the very next thing is going to be coming out, you know, on whatever the issue is, and it will happen right up until the first. Well, the bookmaker said anonymous is Mike Pence. He's the only guy that has, <laughs> has, has the motivation, or one of the only guys. Anyway, that's the show for this week. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much for being part of the show. <laughs>